Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Welcome everybody to the 67th Fireside Chat. Um, thank you all for being here. Our first question is going to be read out by Fouad, who hasn't been with us for quite a while. So please go ahead, Fouad. Hey, Tom. Um, actually, actually, I have a hard time with me as an outsider. In each and every group which I am participating in, I have the problem that I get in conflict because of the rules the group has created or individuals which are giving me the feeling through comments or any other form of interaction that my point of view is stupid, wrong, or not in the line with the group thinking. Often, the result is that the group leaders are giving me the feeling that I, it might be that I'm actually trying to destroy the group, which never is the case inside the reality tunnel in which I am. The last weeks or months I received some information of the importance of outsiders. Important because outsiders are the ones who are forcing the system into new directions because of the impulse they are giving into the system of the group or the group. This force or impulse is always being fighted by the system or the group and causing me as an outsider a lot of emotions and energy. What is your opinion on that topic? Are you perceiving me as an important part of the MBT family? Or would you say that it might be much better or smarter for me to leave that group? Or would you say that the outsiders are important for the survival of the group? Well, let me speak very generally to it first. Um, before I talk personally about that uh, to you, Foad, and that is in general, Diversity is absolutely essential to any group. You don't get much learning and growing if you have a whole bunch of people who have the same attitudes, the same ideas, the same experience, talking about the same topics. And if you have a bunch of sameness, there's very little learning going on. There's a bunch of heads nodding. There's a bunch of uh, let's you know, I'm okay, you're okay, I'll pat your back, you pat my back, we'll tell each other how wonderful we are and how great we're doing and how much we're learning and then we'll all go away feeling good about it. There's a lot of that going on if it's sameness, but there isn't any real learning or not much real learning going on if there isn't anything to challenge, if there isn't anything to pull in new ideas. So diversity is absolutely essential to having a good learning environment. So that's just some fundamental things. As far as this far side chat goes, there's no real restrictions here on what you can talk about. But there are some uh, general rules, I guess. And that is if somebody asks a question, let's say, that only has an interest to a very, very few people. Let's say it's a very technical question. They want to know some detail about, you know, the, physics, some some thing in physics that maybe, uh, you know, I could talk about and they want to talk about that. And it's very interesting to them. But I know that, you know, 90 percent of all the people listening to Fireside Chat, their eyes are going to roll up in their head and they're either going to fast forward or they're going to go do something else because it's just not that interesting to very many people. Um, if somebody is asking questions about issues they have, personal issues they have, that's okay. For most of the time, there's lots of people have those same personal issues. So if you talk about how hard it is for you to to get the point consciousness and keep it steady, well, 90% of the people, you know, starting this, they have that same problem. So that's a personal issue, but it's it's one that is so widespread that it's interesting to almost everybody. Uh, if you talk about um, most anything, feeling down, feeling depressed, being sad, feeling like an outsider. Um, some of the things you've mentioned, uh, feeling uh, like you just don't belong or maybe you don't have, you're not uh, 
you don't have much to offer. Well, a lot of people feel that way. So those are perfectly good things to talk about. If you are worried, let's say, about your dog that didn't come home last night, and you're off talking about all you know the wonderful attributes of this little pooch, well, that's not widely spread. So if you're talking about, oh, my poor dog, he didn't come home last night, and I'm so worried about him, and he does this, and he does that, and I'm, he has this problem, and he needs his medicine, and it goes on and on and on. Well, that's not appropriate, because there isn't many, there aren't many people who will really relate to that and learn from listening to it. So the whole point here is that personal experience is fine. Personal issues and problems are fine. Um, Technology is fine, but it either needs to be short, very short, or it needs to be something that is of general interest to a lot of people. And it doesn't even have to be the majority of people, it's just to a lot of people. You know, so like those talks we had, FOAD, you know, that were just you and I talks, not fireside chat. Those were good. They were interest to a lot of people. When we put those chats out of you and I talking, I don't know how many thousands of, of uh, views they got, but it was many, many, many thousands. I think it got like 5,000 views, you know, in the, in the first few days. So that's interesting because other people feel like you do. And if you read a lot of that, uh, of those questions that came, you'd see that there were a whole lot of people that, that resonated with what you were saying. They learned from watching our dialogue, from the things you said, from the things I said, which then the things you said and our talking, it was valuable to people. So even though that was very personal to you, it was also very valuable to a lot of other people. So that's good. Those are good things to say. So it just depends. There's not like a, a, a it's not like you can't talk about physics. If, if it's not something others would be interested in, make it short not something that will take us a half an hour or more to discuss. That's too much time that leaves most of the people not interested. But if it's most anything else, even personal issues, those are spread wide and deep all through the population. And if people don't relate to it personally, they've got a mother or a brother or a sister or a best friend or a wife or a child that is feeling that same way. They can relate to it other ways. So, so we can talk about um, almost everything as long as it has viability of being interesting to a lot of people. So that's kind of the general idea of this. So all in all, yes, we need, we need people to come from the outside and ask the interesting questions. You know, and that's one of the good things about fireside chat is that many times we will have what I would call new questions, questions that really haven't been asked before, or they're they're asked in new ways. And that's good because when I do when I do Q and A, I spend about eighty percent of that Q and A answering the same questions that I've already answered twenty, thirty, fifty times that if somebody really took the time to look through the YouTube work, they'd find those answers on 10 different YouTubes. But because they don't take that much time, then they ask it and I talk about it. But still, a lot of people are still interested. A lot of people are seeing it for the first time. So it still works. So I don't mind. I don't mind answering the same question 100 times because I'm talking to different audience all the time. And as long as that audience has a lot of people in it that say, yeah, OK, that makes sense to me. Even if that's the 10th time they've heard it, sometimes it takes nine times to get you ready to really understand it. So I don't mind repetition. I don't mind saying it again and again and again. But it's more fun for me and probably everybody else when you have that odd somebody comes in with, you know, some other direction, ask the question that's just never been asked before. That's always refreshing. It's good because now it puts information out that's not been there. But repetition's okay too. So I'd say, Foad, all the, the times that we've talked, it's been good. You've not, you've not been uh, 
uh, a drag on the group. You've been a contributor to the group. And I suspect that would be the case now. So you just have to think about are the things you want to talk about things that matter to people. If it's just you, you know, it's just you and your lost puppy, and it doesn't really, it's hard for anybody else to connect to that, then it's better, that's not a good question to ask. Or if, if it's you asking a question that's going to take, you know, half an hour to answer because it's a big, you know, it's a really big question, and it's, it's something that's going to take a lot of time to work out then maybe that's not quite so good in this forum either. Too technical, too long, uh, too personal, which means it's, I don't mean too personal like like the normal idea, but too restricted just to you, like you and your, you and your puppy. You know, that's too much just about you. So those are the things we don't want to talk about so much because we like to keep these fireside chats interesting to people because if they tune in and they find this long conversation that goes on about something that they really couldn't care less about, then that's it. They may not come back and listen to any more of them. They're done. They tried it. They didn't like it. They're done with it. So we don't want a lot of that in it. If we get into that sometimes, well, that's okay. Life's like that, but we try not to do that too much because we want people to keep coming back. That's the whole point of doing this is to get information out there and to get people to tell other people, hey, this Fireside Chat's got a lot of good stuff in it. You ought, to look, you ought to watch that. That's how it grows. So it has to be kept vibrant and interesting, which is why I try and usually fail, but I, I'm always making an effort to not answer every question, you know, with a 20 minute answer. Uh, on the other hand, I like to answer them from four or five different directions because as I get information back from people who are listening and people who will be listening, I see that I, there's some people who still don't understand it. So then I try it from a different direction. But I need to check myself a little more and make my answers a little more uh, concise and shorter, I think would be better. So I'm part of the, I'm part of the problem uh, as well as far as uh, you know, what's being said here and how long it takes to say it. I'm probably the biggest, uh, you know, I'm probably the biggest uh, one that uh, overruns and, and uh, uh, gets people to roll their eyes and say, oh, this guy never finished, you know, on that particular topic, which is not good. We don't want that. We want it to stay lively and engaging is, is, is what we want. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, you know, personally, but most of the time you ask questions, they're good questions that other people can learn from. And that's all we need. So please, you're welcome. You're welcome to be here. You're welcome to participate. And another thing I would point out to everybody, <laughs> after I just said that I should talk less time, right? I find something else to say. And that is that don't worry so much about what other people think. Don't worry so much about what other people say. If you start off and other people say, oh, Foad, sit down and be quiet. That's not important. Ignore them. If you think it's important, this is your time. Talk. Don't let other people rain on your parade. But be conscious of what we're trying to do here and that it needs to be interesting to the general public for this to be successful, which means as a vehicle, these fireside chats, a vehicle to get this information out. Can't happen if this is dreary or sad or boring, you know, it has to be interesting to people. So keep all that in mind and uh, then just do it. And other people don't like it. It's their problem, not your problem. So yeah. until until the boss comes and tells you that it's not appropriate, just you keep going on. Who's the boss? Me. <laughs> So when I tell you that's enough, Froad, Fro you know, we've already poured too much water down that hole, then, uh, then it's time to change the subject. But other than that, you need to uh, just let it go. Besides, on the back end, we always have some, some room to try to make it a little neater and a little tighter and a little less... Uh, um, long or, or redundant, 
because we have Justin and Justin will edit things and he'll look at it. And if Justin looks at it and says, oh, let's see, they just talked about that five minutes ago. And now they're going over and saying it again. Well, I'll pick the best out of both and put that in, but I can delete, you know, some time out of it. So he can always make adjustments on the back end if he thinks something is inappropriate or whatever. And that's all right. And he also has the complete authority to cut down my my talks. If he says, uh, Tom, he's he's repeated himself four or five times there. Let me cut some of that out and we'll save some minutes. I'm good with that. I like that. You see, so he's he can edit me. He can edit every he can edit all of us to something that he thinks is a tighter, cleaner, better production, because when he's done, that's it. That's the final. That's what goes out to the world. So he's the last he's the last editor and he has carte blanche to edit it any way he wants that he sees fit to make it better. So that's including, like I say, including editing myself. I'll trust Justin to do whatever he wants that he thinks is good. So that's that's the plan. That's what we're doing here. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I left a personal message to you. Maybe um, I leave it now how it is because there's so much in my back head and I don't think it would be good to ask it right here, right now. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. You're welcome. We appreciate, we appreciate you coming and, and sharing with us, Foad. You've, you've, been a, you've been a contributor and that's good. Keep coming back. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, please go ahead next. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Uh, could you give some examples of challenges that entities in other reality frames face in terms of growing up? Assuming they probably have different instincts than we humans do, what sort of fears do they have to deal with? Well, other reality frames, you know, they're different. Other reality frames, that's a whole lot. You know, uh, that's, that's more like than other countries. That's just kind of small differences. And other reality frames cover a whole lot of stuff. But for the most part, their challenges, if you look at the, the fundamentals of the challenge, are the same as ours. You know, it's their point of being there, their point of their purpose for their existence is exactly the same as ours, is to grow up. And that growing up means to make good choices, to make lower entropy choices. That's the whole point. So from that fundamental viewpoint, they're all the same. They're all making learning to make better, lower entropy choices, higher quality choices. That's it. Now, the situations in which they do that differ a lot, but the game's the same everywhere. They, um, you know, they interact. They interact with each other. As they interact with each other, you know, that creates a whole lot of choices for them, just as it does for us. It just as it does for us, interaction is the main instigator of the important choices, is their interaction. The biggest places, the biggest interactions where you learn to grow up are the ones that are the deepest. And, the, you know, and, and the uh, what do we call those? The significant other kind of relationships. And I take a very broad definition of significant other. You know, that significant other could be your children, your spouse, you know, your parents. There's lots of people that fit in a significant other. And the more significant those significant others are, then the more they're likely to teach us. And that significant other can be your boss. You know, there's lots of people with whom you interact that are important to you. Whether you like them or not isn't the point. It's, you know, they're important in your life and you have to deal with them. You can't just walk away and say, oh, well, I don't want to deal with that. You know, I'm a, I'll just not bother with them anymore. You have to bother with them. And that's where the rubber meets the road and you have to make choices. You have to do things that are hard for you to do. You have to start considering others. You have to not be so self-centered. That's where the learning is. And that's the same in different reality frames, you know, even if they're wildly different. For instance, you know, one reality frame I was in, all the characters were much different 
they weren't humanoid at all. There weren't any humanoid characters there. The characters were all very unusual, but yet same dynamics. They interacted the way they interacted, you know, some interacted uh, by wanting to override the free will of others and bully and have their way and self-centeredness. And some were more full of love and caring and wanted to help. And the basic interactive dynamics were similar everywhere. Yes, they had government, they had organization, they had civilization. It just wasn't like ours. But all the fundamentals of individuated un units of consciousness interacting with each other, that was all the same. It's just the details were different. So if you discount the details, mostly it's the same as here. Some more severe, some of it's, uh, you know, the law of the jungle kind of places where everything is very rough and, and uh, violent. But basically that's a different set of conditions, but it's the same individuated units of consciousness making choices and creating the environment in which they live and then having to deal with it. So in the big picture, they're all about the same. In the, in the, in the details, they're vastly different. So does that answer your question or did you really have something else in mind? <laughs> no, I just like I was just uh, interested in how the instincts differ because uh, you mentioned a lot of times that women here live in a kind of relationship space because it's what is best for our instincts and men live more in the outer world. And I was just wondering how that works in other reality frames, if that's very similar or if it's like completely different. Some places it's completely different. Some places the, you know, the species that have grown up in that virtual reality are just very different. And sometimes it's, it's the you know, who's male and who's female is very hard to tell. You know, just like we have species like that, you know, most of us look at a snake. We say, is that a girl snake or is that a boy snake? You know, and nobody knows. How do you tell? You know, I mean, what's the difference? You see, it's so sometimes you go to places that the species there, the dominant species are such that gender is just not an important player. Everybody basically acts the same way. They may have their own rituals for mating and creating more creatures, but uh, it just isn't like us. But then you go to others that it is like us, where gender is very important. Um, so that just depends on the species and how they happen to evolve. Uh, some sometimes it's an important thing. Sometimes it's not. You know, with humans, we probably have more uh, gender separation than most of the rest of the species on this planet. You know, we're we're the extreme end of the of the scale. So when it comes, there's a name for that now, which just happens to escape me. But uh, um. Maybe I'll get to it later as a it's the proper scientific term for um, differences between genders within a species. You know, how much how much uh, differences the male and the female have within a given species. Some it's very little difference at all. Like I say, snakes, you know, there's not a lot of gender difference. There's not a lot of gender difference uh, in uh, most insects very little gender difference in lots of kind, lots of animals. But when you get, let's say, to monkeys, there's some gender difference, but not nearly as much as there is in humans. Chimpanzees have some gender differences, but just a fraction of what humans have. So we are we are way out on the on the uh, far pole as far as uh, having gender differences within the same species. So we're a little bit of an exception, even on our own planet. So most critters, or even our own, our own uh, VR, most most things in most VRs don't have as much di gender dimorphism. Is that right? I think that's the right word. Some kind of thing like that. You know, sci scientists always like to use really big words that nobody else can understand because that makes them seem important. 
but I think it's gender dimorphism is the right word. And uh, uh, we humans have it up to our eyebrows. And that's just because, as I mentioned last time answering your question, that's just because the way we homo sapiens is what we call our humans now, we had lots of competitors. And the way we won that competition was because we evolved to have a lot of sexual dimorphism or gender dimorphism. And that means we specialized in getting pregnant, having babies, and having those babies survive long enough to get pregnant. We were good at that. We were better at that than any of our competitors. So we overwhelmed them with population, absorbed them, absorbed their tiny little minuscule numbers into our huge numbers, and it's almost like they never existed. They couldn't, they couldn't compete. So that's why we are so unusual, because that we just happened to evolve into a space where that unusualness was very survivable for us. It was a very, a very uh, uh, efficient survival attribute to have. So that's why humans, that's why there's so many of us. That's why we have, you know, that's why population, uh, you know, explosion and so on is an issue because of us. That's our that's our calling card. We're the we're the sexiest and and the most prolific, uh, you know, of the of the critters. That's our that's our claim to fame. That we're better at making babies and and keeping them alive than uh, than uh, all the other competitors. So, and we can also maintain large populations. We've learned about farming and things that allow you know, it's to support large populations. So that's just part of who we are. So others, no, not so much. Unless they are sort of like us. But you know, I go to various to various reality frames, and I often do find, though I sometimes find things, critters, I call them, that are very different than us. More often than not, I find others that are, are humanoid. They're very much like us. It almost, you can look at it. Sometimes you'll go to, I've been to those and I'll look at it and I say, well, this looks like uh, Earth in about 1850 in, you know, the Southwest, you know? And I can see the similarities to my own history. I can look at it and, and, and say, you know, well, this is similar to the way we are and mostly it's humanoid. That's the dominant species is the is the humanoid or something like it. So that tends to be more common than not. Now, why is that? I don't know. Maybe having a humanoid with these you know opposable thumbs. Well, chimpanzees have opposable thumbs too, but they don't have the decision space that we do. They didn't take those thumbs and make the tools and do the things that we do. You know, chimpanzees still don't you know, haven't domesticated fire yet. You know, they, they don't use the wheel. They, have, they don't make wheelbarrows to push heavy things around. You know, it, uh, they haven't gotten so far. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, it could be. No, I don't know. It may just be that, you know, you spawn a lot of different kinds of creatures with a lot of different kinds of capacities. Some of them rise to the top. Some of them kind of stub out after a while. But it could be that that system really wants avatars sort of like humans who make a whole lot of significant, important, meaningful decisions. They don't just, you know, pull off bark and then eat the grubs they find under the bark. You know, so the whole decision, the big decision in their life is should they pull the bark off of this tree or that tree and how to find the grubs, you know, which bark is likely to have the most grubs underneath of it that they could you know, that they can eat. That's kind of their decision space that they live in is things like that. It's very small. So the large decision space is the fast growing space as far as conscious evolution, which it's all about. And I can imagine that the system might just tweak some of these simulations 
to get the kind of avatar it wants. After all, it's created the simulation for its own evolution. So that's maybe why human type things show up so far, because that showed to be a, a winner in the consciousness evolution sweepstakes in the in VRs. So it uses it. That's possible. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, you know, here we are with ninety eight percent of the same DNA as a chimpanzee, but yet vastly different. What is that vast difference? Where did it come from? And you know, why did that evolve? Well, the biologists kind of have their own story and a little bit of hand waving in there, but then it may have just worked exactly as they say. Or it may be that the system you know, changed a few things here and there to raise the probability that they'd get an avatar that would be a kind of optimum, optimum trainer for individuated units of consciousness. Possible, don't know. But there is a rather vast, you know, set of differences between us and chimpanzees, even though we share an awful lot of things. And chimpanzees are pretty bright. You know, it's not that they're dumb, they're, they're pretty smart animals, but they're very, very different than humans for that two or 3% difference in DNA. Okay, thank you very much. And then I have like I have a follow up uh, question um, in terms of growing up. So um, you said that in order to optimize our relationships, we should focus on doing whatever makes our partner happy. On the other hand, it's also important for us to be authentic. And sometimes mm -hmm. we end up doing everything to make our partner happy but we end up feeling unhappy and dissatisfied because we don't get to be ourselves and express ourselves authentically. Mm -hmm. uh, could you address that issue? And should we sacrifice our authenticity in order to be the way that makes our partner happy? No, you should not. You should not sacrifice your authenticity. The, the, the problem where there is a where there is a conflict between being authentic and making your partner happy, that conflict can be found in fear, can be ha found in ego, can be found in your beliefs. You know, it can be fa it, that's part of your fear. That's why there's a conflict there. If you get rid of that fear, get rid of that ego, get rid of those beliefs, then the conflict will go away. So the point is to evolve the quality of your consciousness to the point that you can make your partner happy and you're entirely authentic in that process. Those two things need to go together. They need to be, you know, they need to work together. And in as much as they don't work together, I'd say that almost all the time you may come up with a, with a, you know, a, a a situation where it's not so, but 99% of the time, the reason there's conflict is because there's, there's uh, ego, there's fear, there's beliefs, misunderstandings, there's problems, there's not communication, there's, you know, there's things going on that prevent you being authentic and being giving at the same time. So that's the point when when it's all about other then what makes you happy, what fills you with joy is serving other. It's making other happy. That is what makes you happy. When it's about you, what makes you happy is what you want, what I want, what my needs are. That's what makes me happy. So as long as you've got a yeah, but that's not what I want. And that's what I not what I need. And I'm not getting satisfied in my way. Well, that's self centeredness. You see, that's being focused on self. And that self centeredness surely will get in the way of making anybody else happy because self centeredness says me first, I'm important. I need to be happy. And happy is defined in terms of your fears. 
in terms of your beliefs. So what makes me happy? Well, if my fear is that I feel, what, uh, maybe inadequate, and that's my fear, then what makes me happy is for somebody to constantly show me how adequate I am. And if they're not constantly showing me how adequate I am, then I'm not very satisfied and I'm not very happy anymore, you see. So that's the problem there. So there really is, should be no conflict, and you don't sacrifice one to get the other. Now, when you're just learning, okay, we'll, you know, all of us have fear, all of us. I shouldn't say all of us. There are some that have grown beyond it, but most all of us have fear. Most all of us have ego. Most all of us have these things. So that means we're going to find these conflicts. Well, how do we deal with it? We can't say, oh, well, then I can't try this yet because I'm not perfect. <laughs> I have to wait until I'm perfect and then it'll work. No, that's not a good idea. You can't wait till you're perfect before you can try it and see if it'll work because you'll never get there that way. The way you learn is by trying it, having it not work and learning from why it doesn't work, which means learning about how it is your fear is screwing things up. That's how then you grow up, you see. So when you're just trying it anyway, then you do what you're doing, you say, okay, well, I'm going to try just to make my partner happy. And you try that, except you realize that in the process of doing it, some of your needs aren't going met, aren't getting met the way you need them. And you're not happy. And bingo, there's a lesson right in front of you. What are you going to do with that? Well, you can complain about it. I'm not happy. I don't feel good. You need to make me happy. You know, if my job's to make you happy, your job's to make me happy. And if there's something conflicting in there, then, you know, we've got this impossible problem. Well, these are problems that you need to learn from, grow from. Understand, why is it I don't feel happy? What is it about my need? What, where does that need come from? Why is it that making somebody else happy just doesn't, so, you know, make me enthusiastic. You know, it just kind of leaves me. Well, I don't want to be just constantly making somebody else happy. That's just doesn't sound good. Well, that's because you're too self-centered for that even to sound like a good concept. Because what's really important to you is for somebody to make you happy. You see, so anyway, then you learn those and you grow. And as you grow a little, then you keep trying again. And okay, you're going to Try again, and that old thing where you ran into trouble doesn't run into trouble anymore because you kind of learned that. But something else does, and now you learn that. And then you keep trying, and you try for a little bit, and eh, you run into trouble again. But it's something a little different, or maybe it's some of the last two, but you try, you fix that as best you can, and then you keep trying. That's the whole point. You keep working at it. And if it, where it doesn't work, you learn from it. So you can't wait till you're perfect to get in the game. You get in the game wherever you are. And sometimes you have to, what do they say? Fake it before you make it. Sometimes you have to say, well, I know what would make my, my significant other happy. I don't particularly feel like doing it, but I'm going to do it anyway, just because I know it'll make them happy and I know it's a good thing. And you just do it anyway. And if the response you get is good enough, it may erase some of that. I really didn't want to do it anyway. You know, it may get erased to where, oh, this is kind of neat. I'm really making them happy. They really appreciate it. On the other hand, if they appreciate it so much that they just want you to keep doing it and they stop even making you happy because they're sitting there and, you know, in la la lands is as happy as they can be. So they forget about trying to do anything to make you happy. Now suddenly it's a one sided thing where, one person is uh, in nirvana and the other one feels like a slave, you see. Well, that's not going to work either. You know? So then you, you, know, you have to have a little discussion. You have to talk about it. And you have two people who are both trying to grow up. Well, they should, they should expect that they're always going to have to work at it. If they've got this idea that, oh, we'll work at it for a couple of weeks and then we'll have it and life will be bliss from then on, probably won't work that way. We're going to have to work at it probably all of our lives. 
we're going to have to work at it until we get our fears down to a level that, you know, it gets easier than easier. So if you work at it a while and it doesn't work and there's a problem, talk about the problem. <clears throat> See what the cause of the problem is. Be open minded. Don't get defensive. You see, if you're defensive and you talk about the problem, well, not can't. It's not my problem. Yeah, I know there's a problem, but I also know it's not my problem. You see, if you're defensive like that, then you're not going to learn anything. You have to be open. Where is that problem? Open to suggestions. Try things, even if you don't think they'll work, just because somebody else does, and see. So as long as you're open-minded, and as long as you're skeptical, you'll finally get there. And a couple trying to work together and, and love each other, they'll spend 20, 30, 40, 50 years working on growing up. 50 years later, 60 years later, they're still learning and growing up, you see? So don't get discouraged if you run into problems along the way and things aren't perfect. That's just the way it is. It, uh, it's probably going to be that way all your life, but things do get better and better and better as you go. As you learn, every time you learn something, the rest of your life is better. And not only in that one circumstance, but all over your life is better. So it's just a, always be open minded. You know, being defensive is just closed mindedness. It's just self centeredness. Always be open minded. Always be willing to try other people's solutions. See whether you think they work or not, try them. See where they go. Always have a, always be open to people coming from another direction. Like Foad pointed out, you learn more when you listen to people who come from different directions. If it sounds like, well, that's kind of a weird way of looking at it. Well, try to look at it that way. Try to see it from the other person's perspective. Oh, if I was the other person, what would that look like to me? You see, try to understand where that other person, what their reality is like. How did they see reality? Because two people have two different realities. They live in two different realities, and sometimes those realities tend to clash. And you just have to say, well, okay, that's going to happen. Can't help it. Two different realities are sometimes going to make clashes and conflicts. Let's see what we can do with it. Learn it. Get into their head. See what they see. Feel what they feel. Try to understand, then try to fix it for them. And they're trying to understand you and fix it for you. And it just gets fixed. You figure it out. Somebody learns. But the learning isn't often fast. You know, you you got over the last problem and all that's behind you. And it'll probably take you six months to get over the next one. And six months after that to get over the next one. It takes time. You have to be committed to growing up. You're not going to grow up in a couple of weeks. So that's, you know, that would be my overall advice. Be patient. Be persistent. Be open minded. Be skeptical in your relationships mainly skeptical of yourself. It's really, really easy to be skeptical of somebody else. That's trivial. You don't have to work at that. You have to work at being skeptical of yourself. What's my fear say? Why do I have this attitude? Why do I say the things I say? And if you can figure out that about yourself, well, then share that with your significant other. And hopefully they're really trying to understand you. And if they can understand you better, then everything will work better. And if you can understand them, so try to see the world through their reality. What is their reality like? How do they see that? See, that's rather than the self-centered thing as well. This is my reality and it is just the way I am. So this is what makes me happy and I'm not getting it. So there's a problem. And the problem is you're not making me happy. See, that's a very self-centered approach. There's something wrong. It must be your fault. That generally doesn't that generally doesn't work that way. Yeah, if there's something wrong. It must be your fault. So if you have that approach, then you're going to struggle and, and, and complain a lot. You know, you have to not have that, that defensive 
attitude. So maybe that'll help. That was very helpful, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Samuel, Samuel's a new guest on the Fireside Chat. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tom. Thank you so Hi, much for being here. I've written my question down. It's, would it be possible for the LCS to make an arrangement with an IUOC on virtual Earth such that the LCS could channel some of its energy and intention for healing and positive transformation into and through that IUOC so that all the people that request healing from the IUOC would receive it directly from the LCS's intent? And or would the same dynamic be possible between an IUOC in a non-physical world and an IUOC in this physical world? And two modalities that come to mind are Reiki and Vortex Healing, which I've come in contact with. They describe the divine being the mm -hmm. source from which the energy is transmitted. Mm -hmm. and they're specifically vague about that. Yeah, so is that is that kind of a system possible? Is what yes. you're, you're saying? Yes, that kind of system is possible. Um, and it may work well whether there's anything more behind it than placebo or not. So basically, if you have a, if you develop some sort of a system, say, of healing, and if you have a source, and that source heals, and here's different things and ways you go through to get that source to heal you, and you know, so now we have something that, that uh, has its rituals, has its symbols, like in Reiki, you know, it's got its symbols, it's got its rituals, which is the ways you go about doing things and a placing on of hands if you're a beginner or you don't need hands to be placed on if you're not a beginner. And, you know, it's got different levels of learning and, and different levels of rituals and things that you do, the way you say things, the words you say um, and repeat. If you have that, there is a couple of things that might go on to support that. One of them is, let's say there is no active source that's actually doing something. Let's say it's, a, it's an idea, it's a, con it's a concept. It's a, we can say it's a placebo, but it's a, uh, it's a way of focusing your intention in order to make things happen. And what you're making happen is healing. Okay, it's a way of focusing attention. So many of the tools that we use to, to heal, many of the, the um, I don't know what to say, the, the collective schema and rituals and symbols and tool sets that we use for healing, many of those are just collections of things and attitudes and ways of seeing reality and what can I think ideas that help people change themselves that help one person change another okay so if you have this idea that the divine works through these symbols you know if we go back a few thousand years we'd say the you know the cross was a big symbol Right, it's a big Christian symbol, and wearing a cross around your neck could do all kinds of wonderful things to keep you safe and to keep you healed and had lots of magical powers. And there were monks that could heal and had seemingly magical powers. But all of this mostly is people learning how to focus their intentions on a positive outcome to get themselves into a, a being level space, into an intuitive space, and then focusing a well-defined, thought-out intent on a result, and caring about the result, not just wishing that it comes true, but wanting it to be, wanting that person to be healthier. Caring, so they put Energy, you know, call energy. Energy is a metaphor. Put energy into it. 
And that works and people get better. And people knowing that you're going to work on them and if they have some, if you have some credibility in your ability to, to help them, then that all by itself will help them get better. That'll be the placebo end of it. They're saying, oh, okay, I'm going to go to this person and they're going to stick little sticks in me. And uh, when I'm all done, I'm going to be much better. Well, they mostly will be much better. Okay. And if you aren't just doing something random, but if you have theory to explain what you do with these little sticks and where they come from and the special kind of wood that you use and that they get blessed by, you know, the high mufti of, you know, Zaza or something before they get sent out and you've got all these other things, then that just raises your credibility and makes it all that much more believable. So that when people go in and get the real thing, you know, with the real sticks and so on, then they'll get healed much better because they have more, you know, the, the placebo effect is a lot stronger. And if the people themselves have to suffer something, if they have to pay a lot of money, uh, that suffers them, that you know, makes them suffer a bit. If they have to do something that is uncomfortable, if they have a long process, they have to fast for four days first, whatever. If you make it a, a process where the subject has to invest in some way, money, time, pain, effort, any way that they have to invest, that will make the placebo effect a lot stronger. Okay, because they've invested in it. They have a investment in a positive outcome. Well, that's what placebo is. It gets somebody thinking positively. And the more energy you put into it, the more you will want to believe that it's positive. The more effective it will become. So if you have a healer, even if he's a good healer and he's free, he doesn't charge anything. He just calls you up on the phone and says, you're healed. You hang up the phone and that's it. It was a third, you know, it was a five second thing. He calls you up, say, yeah, hello, hi, you're healed. Thank you. Goodbye. You know, would it work? Not very well. Even if he was a really, really good healer, it's not going to work very well because there's no investment. There's no buy in. There's no connection. There's no nothing to, you know, to make that connection. So there's lots of I'm saying there's just lots of things involved in it. It's not just as simple as this energy goes out and heals things and the energy comes from the divine and all that's part of the theory that makes it work. And you need to have kind of a, a theory, if you will, a story to make your thing credible. You can't not have a story. So you make up a story and almost always the story has to have some, some, uh, you know, some buy-in required, some money to be paid. You have to go prepare yourself in some way. You know, there's something that you have to do to do it. And that helps. So these are what I call tool sets. When I tell people about healing, you know, I say, well, take your energy bar tool and it's this, this bright white light. And you just take that stuff that isn't good. That's dark and you turn it white. Those are just tools. You see, there's just things that people make up in their minds. That energy bar tool is what you imagine. But it provides a process by which people can can focus their intent on healing. And it's not only does the person being healed can focus their intent on it and being healed, but the person doing the healing can focus their intent through that tool. So the active ingredient is really focused intent. That's the active ingredient. But the tools are ways of doing that, ways of focusing that intent. And the tools can be anything that anybody can make up. Anything that you can make up that sounds credible to somebody, you know, will work. Anything that you can make up that sounds credible to you helps you. Do the healing too. So you know if you if the healer needs tools as well, but the tool the the healer has to make up tools that sound credible to him or her. 
So if a glowing white energy bar tool sounds good to you, that sounds, yeah, that sounds pretty powerful. That's good. Almost, you know, better than a magic wand. You know, it's a long bar and I can reach out and touch some bad thing and it'll turn good. Well, if that sounds credible and it's a good thing, then that's a really good tool. You see? So that's why there's so many different modes of healing. If you wonder, you know, if you look around, if you go alternative healing on Google, you'll probably get, you know, 10 million, 20 million replies, right? And there's thousands of different kinds of modalities of healing. And guess what? They all work. Well, most of them work. Some of them are just scams, but most of them aren't. Most of them work. And they work because somebody has generated a tool set that people can find, that people find credible and that they can connect to in some way. And that's all that's necessary. So that's the general truth in, you know, in, in healing modalities. Now, is it possible, back to your original question, is it possible that the larger conscious system could say, oh, Samuel Jacob, I want you to be a healer and I will heal people through you. So you go lay your hands on people and I will heal them for you. And you will now be the tool of the larger consciousness system. And you can call people up on a telephone and in 10 seconds, you can say you're healed, George. And just like that, George is healed. And could the system do that? Is that possible? Yes, the system could do that. That is possible. Why? Because the system can do anything it wants. It's a virtual reality. The system owns the virtual reality. It makes the data stream. It can basically do anything it wants. But now, would the system want to do that? Well, maybe. You know, maybe he wants to do that. There may be some reason that that would be a good idea that Samuel Jacob would be a, a you know, a, a prophet, uh, you know, that would go uh, sing the, the songs of the larger consciousness system and draw a lot of people to him. And a lot of people would listen to him because he also can heal them. Yeah, that might work. That might be a good idea for a while, but I think after a while that would, you know, that would kind of run out. He need the system would need another game, you know, that one game just doesn't last forever. So they need to do other things, but yeah, that could work for a while. That could be, that could be fine. And what would happen is that uh, Samuel might end up feeling really, really important and really, really uh, whatever and get, yeah, so puffed up about it that pretty soon Samuel would be useless as a tool and have to be let go and you have to go find another tool. You know, so that happens too. So it would, it would depend, but yes, entirely possible. But most, mostly what you have going with all these thousands of modalities of healing is that you have tool sets that people have created. And the tool sets job is to help both the healer and the healed focus their intent on changing the future probability to better health. That's kind of the way it works. So I don't know if that answered probably more answer than you wanted, but it's uh, hopefully a more complete answer for all the listeners out there who all have some kind of modality that is the truth. And mostly it is a, it does work. Like I say, of all of those modalities, you'll find people who will swear by them. Oh yeah, that works. That worked for me. You know, I had all this trouble and then I started, you know, squirting lemon juice in my ear every morning, you know, and then, uh, you know, doing a somersault. And I did that for three weeks and I feel so much better. It's the lemon juice somersault therapy. It works wonders. And you can find, you know, if you wanted to sell that, you could probably eventually find, you know, hundreds of people who would swear to it that it changed their life. And the answer is, it can change their life. It's not that that's just a hoax, but it can change people's lives. If it can make them more positive toward their physical outcome, make them more hopeful, 
give them something that will work, then it does change their lives. It is useful. It is a therapy and it works. So it doesn't have to have a physical cause to make it a valuable therapy. So a lot of therapies all have something kind of woo woo in the middle someplace, you know, if there's cosmic energy or, uh, you know, some other kind of thing, you know, the, the, you know, the love of the cosmos or, or I don't know, you know, touch of the divine, something the the angel Gabriel energizes this thing, you know, charges it every night and I use it every morning. You know, there's some kind of a thing. Often it goes to some non-physical attribute. And the reason why that works so well is that most illnesses are not really sourced from the physical. Some are. Obviously, you break your arm. Well, that's a physical issue. You know, the bone got so much stress, it broke. Nothing there but a physical issue. But you will find that the great percentage of illness has its roots in things like stress. You know, not broken bones, not physical issues, but in spiritual and mental issues and emotional issues like stress, unhappiness, feeling unworthy, negativity of any sort. That's where most of the problems come from. And you can heal those problems with tools, with attitude. If you can change their attitude, you can change their health. Well, how do you change their attitude? You can't do it intellectually. You have to get it inside them somehow. So for that, you need a system that allows that to happen. You know, like they found with, with physicians that are all just physical matter guys, right? And they found out the physicians that actually talk to their patients and spend some time with them and listen to them, their patients get better much more frequently and stay better, much better than doctors who treat everybody like a slab of meat comes down on a conveyor belt. They look at it, inspect it, listen to it, put the telescope or not telescope, but the stethoscope on it, make a pronouncement, write a prescription, push the button and the conveyor belt takes the meat down to the next station. You know, if they get that kind of health care, then those people are not nearly as good at healing people even if they prescribe all the same medicine. They're just not as good. So patient gets the same medicine in either case, but the one where the doctor actually talks to him like a human being and cares about him or pretends to care about him, at least if the pretense is good enough that the patient believes it, then they heal more completely, more quickly. You know, good bedside manner, that's called. And it's effective medicine. Most of our illness is stress related. I'm just calling I'm using stress as a word that handles all the negativity in your life. All that fear. You know, st stress is just the causation of fear, you know, the fear is the causation for the stress. So yes, those things are entirely possible. And that's generally how healing modalities work. They work with tools. They work with stories. They work with, uh, I don't know, practitioners who have learned how to focus their intent at the being level. Because that's more powerful intent than one that's not focused at the being level. And that takes some practice. You know, to be a good practitioner, you need to do some work on yourself first. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'd also like to mention that on Facebook, if some of you are on Facebook, there is the MBT outpouring, which Tom gives an introduction to as to how that is valuable as well as the healing. We have many, many talented healers on that website who are admins and who visit that website for those who want to place a request for healing. Um, that is uh, the MBT outpouring.
Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.